Hey everyone, welcome to a special conversation for the Legend Fiction Show. Today I'm joined by Madeline Carroll, who's all the way over in the UK. Although if you're in the UK, I'm all the way over in the United States. Hi, Mar Madeline. Good to see you. Good to have you with Hi. us. Hi. Nice to see you. Thank you for having me. It's great. So last time that we chatted, this was back before we were called Legend Fiction. So it's fun to have you come back and then to join us um, in this conversation for our upcoming convention, Legend Haven. And for those who didn't know, Legend Haven is the biggest online Catholic and Orthodox uh, convention for sci-fi fiction and uh, and fantasy. And I say it's the biggest because there aren't any others. So we are doing it year over year. We're building our annual event uh, and it is brought to you by the legendfiction.com community. So we'll talk a little bit about that towards the end. But today, Madeline is someone who has self-published a whole swath of children's books. And I think a lot of them emerged out of out of your love, Madeline, for wanting to communicate certain things to your children and then not finding the books out there that are going to do it. And so you just went and made them yourself. I mean, <laughs> the gumption is just fantastic. So the title for today is Delving into a Relationship with Our Good Shepherd Through Story. Uh, welcome back to the show. And why is that that title, that idea so meaningful to you as a mother? Thank you. Yes. So, well, um, I have a great love for our Lord as a good shepherd. Um, and it was really kind of, it was really strengthened when I um, trained as a catechist with Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, which is this amazing catechesis for children, inspired by Maria Montessori's um, sort of style of teaching and learning. And um, Obviously, the Good Shepherd is an integral part of the catechesis. And um, and you I always remember this one image stayed with me when I was studying Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. It was this photo of a child in hospital who was very sick. And he was being shown the Good Shepherd work from Catechesis, which is an amazing, it's like a wooden 2D Good Shepherd on a, a round. I mean, it's universal all over the world this this particular material it's made the same everywhere so it's like a round wooden board meant to be the, the fold with like a fence that goes around too and then you've got a good shepherd with a sheep on his shoulders you know the typical mm -hmm. one and then lots of little wooden sheep and you read the scripture of the lost sheep while you work with the materials and I remember seeing this amazing photograph of this boy being shown in his hospital bed this work and it he really developed a great love for it um so I I really want my children and all children really to find God through that merciful eyes of like the good shepherd, really mm -hmm. loving them and searching them out. Mm -hmm. And also because I needed to see him like that as a good shepherd that really loves me and is ever merciful and is constantly searching me out yes, <laughs> in yes. all my anxieties and in all of my mm -hmm. lostness. Um, so, and I realized with the different stories that I wrote, um, I wanted to bring that to the fore, but there's a particular book I wrote, which is called Ephraim's Gladness, which came out of like a sad time in my life. Um, that t is is a twist on the parable of the Good Shepherd and the Shepherds of Bethlehem. And oh. it's a, about a shepherd called Ephraim, um, who um, he, he sort of struggles sometimes in his prayer life. He can be dry, he can be anxious. And uh, the first image, actually, that an amazing illustrator from the US, actually, uh, Randy Freemel, he did this amazing shepherd um, and his face was very, you could really enter into that face. It was sort of anxious, but it was sort of, it was a really de a depth to the face of this shepherd. And that's how the story starts. And it said that Ephraim carried on praying, rain or shine, no matter how he felt. Um, and one day he's out with his flocks and he's watching all of these people going for the census to Bethlehem. He's watching all the crowd, clouds of dust being, you know, taken up by all these crowds on their way. And then he's taking all of his sheep home and he gets back to his sheep fold and he's counting them all in and he's lost one. So he goes out looking for this little um, lost sheep and um he finds her on a ledge and he brings her home in his shoulders and wants to tell his friends and have a party but all of his friends have gone somewhere and he sees them off in the distance so he runs after them and they're all gone to the stable at bethlehem and oh, that is um, so fun he finds them there and it and it says that he finds the young lamb of god the king of the universe I like I I give our Lord different titles in mm -hmm. in that last page where he finds Jesus. Yeah. So although Ephraim is the good shepherd, he also finds his good shepherd at the stable 
he finds his lost sheep, but then he also finds the Lamb of God at the stable. So it's like this whole combining the parable of the, of the, the Good Shepherd, which we use a lot in Catechesis mm -hmm. Good Shepherd, with this very, you know, classic nativity story. Yeah. Um, and then what I found over the years of writing is that I like, I generally write biblical sort of themes mm -hmm. and I like to add at the back of the book um just to make it more catechetical I add scripture quotes in uh, that would tie in with the story or yeah. that have inspired the story what I find is fascinating you just mentioned there's the at the back of the book you might include something a little more catechetical and what's valuable is that there are so many different kinds of stories that serve different kinds of needs and some are going to be more overt in in your case what's fascinating is you've crafted these stories where the stories themselves is a beautiful story, but it doesn't necessarily hit you over the head and it isn't it isn't yeah. moralizing, but you've got this reflection maybe that the grown-ups might read if they want to know like what's going on yeah. in this and so on. Um, and that I think it still goes to show this the same principle of when it comes to a child, some stories you want to explain and it's like a fable like from Aesop where you're going to mm -hmm. say exactly what it is. Don't do this and this or something. But then there are other stories where you want to enchant the child. And sometimes you can't give away the ending or you can't give the reason. Yeah. Um, uh, adults might want to have those conversations and actually take it apart and see like, why, how does this thing work? So you can put it back together. Again. Children don't really want to do that. They need to be able to like maybe intuit the whole thing. I'm curious, why, why do you think the, the devotion to the good shepherd is something that is uh, so important, especially for children and maybe especially today? Uh, why do you think that's, it's something that you keep coming back to in in your stories yeah i suppose the image of almost like a father figure that really loves us and he yeah. will well he'll go out and search for us but also the fact that he i love the idea of a party he is so joyful when he finds us he wants to go and have a party mm -hmm. and children understand parties right parties are fun <laughs> there's fun yeah. for adults and they're really fun for children and so the fact that also this Shepherd wanted to go back and um so I think one of the first uh, if I've got this right uh, I did train as a catechist but I haven't um been trained I haven't actually been working as a catechist for a few years now since having all the children but mm -hmm. if I've got this right one of the first main works that the children work with in Catechist of the Good Shepherd is the parable of um the Good Shepherd and so they read they actually read the directly from scripture it's not watered down at all it's directly from like whatever version you've got RSV or whatever mm -hmm. the story of like he founds his lost sheep and he goes and he wants to have a party sort of thing if I've got that right <laughs> if it's not the first one it's one of the very you know it's one of the early ones early works mm -hmm. and it's like I I feel like for children to know that, again, yeah, and you can use subtle language. You don't need to say this is God. It's it's as a shepherd. It's someone that children can relate to. Oh, a shepherd, someone who looks after his sheep. We know sheep. Mm -hmm. You know, children learn all about the farm animals when they're growing up from very, very young, you know. And it's mm -hmm. like, okay, shepherd looks after his sheep. And also this shepherd is so in love with his sheep that he wants to go and have a party afterwards because yeah. he yeah. cherishes them. Mm -hmm. And even the idea of having it over your shoulders, like, you know, dads put their kids on their shoulders. and. Yeah and it's fun so i feel like that imagery is really mm -hmm. captivating to a child and also i love the subtlety that it doesn't as you said we can we can show our children the gorgeousness of our faith in really subtle ways mm -hmm. um, as well yeah what i love also about that parable is well this is, speaks more to adults perhaps than children maybe it creates a sense of confidence in children but this sense that the sheep is uh, in some terrible place, maybe on the brink of an abyss, yeah. and uh, he'll crawl all the way down to, instead of be like, you know, I'm just going to cut my losses and I'll just buy another one. It yeah. like, doesn't act that way. He gets down there, pulls, you know, I'm trying to imagine, you know, you, you find a sheep in a terrible place on the brink of an abyss and you're like, you're, you're frozen. You can't mm. go up. You can't go down. You've got just enough to stay standing or sitting. Yeah. And you can't move and you need to be pulled out of there. As an adult, that is such a comforting yeah. um story to to live in and then to be teaching children that stuff might happen to you in the future you might get into things things might yeah. happen to you your friends might get involved in whatever life choices but for all of us to be grounded in a narrative like that it gives yeah. us a lot of patience and a lot of hope and yeah. ultimately hope. i think a lot of joy yeah i love yeah. the holy father is big into this this whole theme of the good shepherd the good samaritan Yes. The person who never abandons anything. Yeah. 
And you know, like love is that cliched word, but actually I'm realizing more and more as I grow older, that love is the one thing that um, in all its different forms, like it's the one thing that um, gives us hope actually. Mm -hmm. So like with one of my children who has learning difficulties, um, the way I'm able to get through to her on a really difficult day is the love. <laughs> sometimes it's just literally she's having a real meltdown and I'm just sitting her on my lap and just holding her. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, I'm so burnt out. I don't know what to say, but I'm just holding her. Um, and I, yeah, I think that that is, that that is something that hope is a big thing for me, a big theme for me as well. And so for us to have the hope, of seeing someone who loves us so unconditionally and will get down mm -hmm. there with us on those yeah. scary places, on those scary ledges mm -hmm. and try and haul us out if we're ready <laughs> to be hauled so out. Let's keep following that thread because that's interesting. When you you go the other route and you're looking at, and obviously we both have young children um, mm. and we're going to the library or looking for materials online. Um, I th there's there's a Darth of... Of content of of books mm. that are actually rooted in in this kind of hope. What are what are some um, what are some concerns that you have about the level of storytelling that you're seeing today? And mm. reason why I ask this is because we've started a community because we believe that we need to we need a whole lot more of this faith inspired stuff. You know that might yeah. get dark uh, and maybe as dark as it needs to, but the darkest that we ever get is the ledge of the abyss. Um, yes. And maybe that's where the story needs to end for grownups. For kids, you can't. Um, but that's that's where the story might need to to be about that ledge and that experience. Um, yeah. So that when the, the shepherd, you know, finally does arrive and pull you back just one millimeter, there's that little bit of hope like, okay, I'm not yeah. alone in this, you know. Um, but for you as someone raising children and then just – going the next step of creating these stories. I'm curious, what, what are you thinking and, and working through um, and looking at the culture and, and wanting to raise, raise your children and then creating things? Where does your, where does your mind go with that? Yeah. So I've always loved children's stories always. And I've loved going to the library with my mom. It was like our weekly thing. We were homeschooled, you know, and she's going to take us to the library. So all the different libraries, some of them are big libraries in town. Some of them are the little village libraries. And yeah, I love children's books. And there are still many children's books that I grew up with that I just invest in for my kids. And we just have like libraries all over the house, like little shelves everywhere. So I do, I, I still do see a lot of joyful books out on those shelves. Um, mm -hmm. And I suppose with the books that I'm trying to create now is is bringing those joyful stories, which children need to build their imaginations and their inner worlds, you know, uh, but just combining them with the creator who loved them and who understands them in their varying needs. Um, so just this Easter gone, I wrote a book called Beholding Beauty. Mm -hmm. And it was... It was sort of um, inspired by um, by Bible times on the lake of uh, Lake Galilee, but mm -hmm. it's kind of made up. It's about a boy who's blind um, mm -hmm. called Jeremiah, and his father could be like one of the disciples that went fishing with Jesus, but he's blind. He lives on Lake Galilee, and I wanted to express it that, yes, the boy was blind, um, but he had no... Um, he, he had so much love in his lifestyle. He was so loved. He was also very gifted with his hands. Like he could mend the nets better than any of his siblings. Um, he had that real sense of touch was really refined. And, um, and again, I wanted to be subtle. So I didn't really name Jesus. Okay. What I said was his dad had been out night fishing with some friends and he got up early and he made his way outside sort of like, and I made it kind of realistic. So we had to feel along the wall to get out. And he went outside and he heard the boat coming in. and But it said that the boat felt like different this morning. It, sorry, not felt. He heard it sounded different this morning as if the mm -hmm. boat lay lower in the water. Like the way the oars were working, it just sounded different to him. And he's mm -hmm. obviously heard many boats going in and out because um, his dad is a fisherman. And then he heard someone calling his name. And it was it was our Lord after the resurrection. And I just said it, it was the man who goes by many names, um, risen Lord, Messiah. Um, and he took Jeremiah's hand and it said Jeremiah could feel like the wounds in the man's oh, hands. Wow. Um, but it said for the first time in his life, Jeremiah wanted to be able to see. Um, so I am not, I want to, this book to go out to children with disabilities, even something as harsh as blindness potentially. And I'm not trying to say 
though, that their life is still not very, very good. Because at the very mm. beginning of the book, Jeremiah's life is good and he's got a talent and a gift and he's using it and he yeah. is happy. Yeah. Um, but by the end, his dad comes in on the boat and they have this amazing story to tell that they weren't, they didn't catch anything all night. And then Jesus told them to put it out on the other side and they did and they caught these fish. And Jesus was cooking breakfast on the shore and Jeremiah was helping him or whatever. And then um, Jesus turns to Jeremiah and is like, would you like to be able to see? And it's just like amazing. And he's like, yes. <laughs> and so he touches his eyes and he sees and he sees like butterfly wings. Um, and he sees shaft of light in the bonfire smoke that's going up from like the, the fish that are cooking. And he sees his dad's like astonished face. And then he sees the face of Jesus and he beholds beauty. And I wanted children to 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 find hope in this story um, through knowing that even if you have a disability like my daughter hers is a bit more um nuanced we can't quite work out what's going on with her it's uh, potentially on the spectrum we think there's adhd i think there's a, a whole combination of things there's a language disorder too so hers isn't as blatant as blindness but um but i want also ch children to see that it's okay to, to that we all have we all have strengths and we all have weaknesses and we might not all get healed either now in this story the boy did and then what i did is at the back of the book i i drawn two stories from scripture one was a man born blind that was healed and the other one was the miraculous cat the second miraculous catch of fish mm -hmm. um so the children can still go straight to scripture and see that this actually did happen but then i do write i always write a note to parents at the beginning of all my books explaining how the parents could use the book and i said look this is just a make-believe story based on things our lord did do mm -hmm. but within all of that i want children to because there is still beautiful storybooks out there um but i also want children to see be more beautiful storybooks hopefully where they find God subtly and they find his love for them um, throughout all their life with their different needs and their strengths and their weaknesses and also that miracles do happen as well. <laughs> Gosh, everything that you're saying is just, I don't know, it's just beautiful. You're going to make me cry in a second. This whole <laughs> mission that you're on, um, there needs to be more beautiful books, more hope, you know, mm. um, and cultivating this world outlook. This is something that I've grappled myself with with my little girl, and we've had a. Uh, we're trying to find the the line between how much do we share, how much exposure mm -hmm. to the world. I think every yeah. every parent's kind of grappling with that. So having people like yourself who are committed to. This is a specific message that our world needs right now for all sorts of reasons, and one of them being we're all swimming in a sea of very silly philosophy and mm. thinking and the idea that you don't matter and you know and or if god is there then he's a nasty taskmaster yeah. and you know you don't want to get on his bad side because reasons having something like this which mm. is i think we should confidently argue this is the gospel message this is the nature of god this mercy and love and hope um mm. and then feeding and filling our children with this this sort of thing so what's yeah. your with the, with what you're doing you've started i think is it your own little publishing company um mm. what is your mission with that and then what is your dream that people would do in in this space especially around children's books yeah so i yeah i set up as i books in 2020 so a few of my books have been published traditionally by traditional publishers like holy heroes in America and the Second mm -hmm. Spring in the UK and Catholic Mothers in the UK. Um, but then I set up as iBooks because I had so many stories I wanted to get out there. And I have a really lovely team. It's basically, I write the books, I find the illustrators and I pair up with these amazing illustrators. I've just paired up with an amazing sister, actually, an amazing nun who's just done my latest Christmas book. How cool. And then, uh, yeah, she's, she's a brilliant artist. It's so exciting. And then um, I just have this amazing local Christian uh, printers, a family of nine children, and it's one of the fa it's a father and one of the sons. This lovely printers who who do all the formatting for me because I'm horrendous on technology. So they like do all the graphic design for me, to, like bring it all together really beautifully, and then they print it for me. So it's been really fun, and um, to sort of do that. And I suppose my mission is to, yeah, help children discover God for a start, discover their creator. I love this title for our Lord, King of the Universe. And I often say it to the children during mass when we're like watching the consecration. I'm trying to like, come on, you know, they're so distractible. I'm like, yeah, you know, King of the Universe, uh, he's there and we kind of look up at the host. And I, I want them to discover him um, as King of the Universe, their creator, their good shepherd. And I want to show him to them in different ways as well. Um, 
as he's as he has manifested to us in different ways um and in, in different faces <laughs> of god um and i suppose i'd love more books like that to come out um just in general um I, I saw recently, um, I don't know if it was on a Christian thing, but I just saw it on my Instagram. This lady has produced these amazing books for children. Um, like, so there's like a whole stack of them. I'm going to get some of them, but like, it's for autism, for ADHD. So it's about children. This child has autism and it's, um, this child has a stutter. And it said, the title is um, Will, I can't remember his name, Will's Voice is Like a River or something. I mean, they're really like affirming, really beautiful books. Now, I'm not sure if they're Christian. Um, I, I feel like it would be amazing to get like a Catholic, Christian or Catholic um, mindset combined with that as well, like children with their different struggles to find God I'd like that, like, you know, Will as voices like a river. I just thought that was really beautiful. Um, so I think we need more books like that. You know, we are in a a generation where there are so many labels to give children and it's all a bit overwhelming and you're not even sure if some of them you know some children just need to to grow out of their struggles as well but some children genuinely do have real struggles and i'd love i think we i think there's a there's a real need for good catholic books that show god as this loving creator who loves us and will help us through all our various struggles yeah. um and loves us for who we are as well loves yeah. the fact that some people are just struggling with this and some people are struggling with that and he finds the beauty in it and one of my books um which is based on the little drummer boy story um basically this little drummer boy has adhd i mean he cannot sit still he cannot stop making noise but at the end of the story he's the one that calms baby jesus down with his drumming um so i also want to show children that they can use <laughs> they're like my daughter as well with her noise they can use their noise to bring glory to god as well um yeah. so i'd like to see more of that and that's for very young children um but also i'd like to maybe eventually branch out into something for young adults as well and their mm. needs um i recently wrote a pro-life story um about a, a lady in a crisis pregnancy and just you know how difficult pregnancy really is it really is difficult but also that there was hope so when the baby was born at the end of the book it said hope happened um and she the, the mother knew that she still had a long winter still had to run its course but hope had been born in her arms in her heart and hope would see her through so I feel like there's a need for that too in this world we mustn't like deny the fact that the world is dark and crisis pregnancies are horrendous and we mustn't deny that um <laughs> but we must also see show that there is hope in the darkest of circumstances yeah i agree i think so too are you um so do you oh this is a conversation go all kinds of ways um mm -hmm. so with your with azaya books do you mm -hmm. publish other people or is it primarily your own yeah so primarily my own um but in the last couple of years i have published um an amazing author. He's a friend of mine, Roy Peachy. He's a really brilliant author. I published a couple of his. The first one was A Little Book of British Saints, just because I'm doing this uh, amazing homeschooling curriculum, an American one, actually. And um, he wrote uh, a British history course because there's lots of British people doing this Mother of Divine Grace um, mm -hmm. curriculum. And there's loads of British people doing it here in the UK. So he wrote um, a British history for grade five or something. He wrote like just all these different saints. And I was doing it with my kids. Mm -hmm. And I was like, we need to make this into a book because these stories are brilliant. So I got one of my illustrators to illustrate mm -hmm. 33 saints. And we just made it into a book because I, I wanted it for myself. And then he went and wrote this historical novel about, um, it's an amazing, it's such a great story called Meg and the Great British History Mystery. And it was, um, at, it was sort of a child's guided tour through her dreams, these dreams she keeps having through history, ending with St. Alban, which is the patron, like the first martyr in Britain. And so I, oh, I published that as well because I just really wanted it for my kids. And actually, it's the first book I, I normally read to my kids over lunchtime. And I've got, a, you know, I've got a 12 year old daughter down to a four month old son and lots in between. And, you know, it's a struggle to get them all to listen <laughs> to my books. But that book <laughs> kept everyone really excited. Uh, even wow. my 12 year old, you know, is like the moody tween. <laughs> so like, it's a great book. And um, yeah, so I publish his too, but the rest mm -hmm. are mine. Fantastic. Um, what's your process for 
creating a story and then getting it through to completion? Like how how quickly mm. or or how involved is the process, especially if you're working with illustrators? I know that I asked you this mm. last time, yeah. but it's I'm sure people are curious to know uh, as well if they're also in the space of creating children's stories. So how how do you go about it? Yeah. So when I have an idea I quickly like just write it into my phone you know uh, and if I have it I just write it into my phone and send it as a whatsapp to my husband so it's like saved and then I was like you don't need to read this you know <laughs> I'm just just ideas and then I eventually you know one weekend if, if I have time I'll type it all out as a word document and then I if I have illustrators I have quite a, a nice selection now that I go back to again and again um mm -hmm. Um, I'll approach one of them and sort of say, you know, would you like to illustrate this? And so then they work on the illustrations, usually it takes them a few months. And then I I kind of edit it all and just look over and make sure no spelling mistakes it takes quite a while to do that. Mm -hmm. And then I just um, send it off to my printer and they kind of format it really nicely on the page. I think formatting is really important because you can self-publish a book quite easily, but if you don't format it properly and I don't I don't have the expertise to do that so if you don't format it properly they can look quite badly made and they're all mm. a bit clunky the pictures and the text it's all just okay. so I I've learned that over time as well some of my earlier books weren't as brilliant so now I I'm working harder with my formatter to make things mm -hmm. a lot more beautiful looking like we have background color for the text pages and that fit in with the color of that image on that page and mm -hmm. things so we're working on our formatting and um, so they'll work on that for maybe three weeks, the formatter and the printer, then we'll print mm -hmm. off a whole load. And then that's yeah. a big risk because then you yeah. need to make sure you sell <laughs> mm -hmm. to get yak. So I I definitely don't do this for lots of money. Uh, I break even usually. But, you know, the more I get my name out there, the more I have repeat customers and, mm -hmm. and it kind of helps. So it's a great, it's great. It takes a few months, I'd say, sure. for per book. Okay, so you definitely go the route of um, printing a batch and storing it, and then mm. who handles the shipping and handling sort of thing? Is that you yourself? Me, yeah. Wow, so that's a bunch of work on top of um, yeah. your own family and everything else you have going. Yeah, I mean, I did do it through Amazon for a while. I went through KDP, and a few of my books okay. are still on Amazon, mm -hmm. um, but I prefer working now with the printers because um, sometimes some of the Amazon things have printed wrongly or they've stapled it wrong. The and quality, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's the risk. No, I hear yeah. that. Okay. So last then question then is, um, like you you said that you, you break even on the process, and I'm, mm. I'm then curious, how do you then – how, how do you do that? What's your process then of, um, of of marketing, of getting the word out, of getting to a point where you do break even? I think a lot of us, yeah. especially for self-publishing, are concerned that I might put all this investment in okay. and then I'm stuck with, you know, if I print a batch because I want to maintain control and that's important to yeah. someone. How do you then, what's been working for you in terms of uh, yeah. getting it to a point where you do break even and then start making something? So... I, I'm not very good um, at, you know, marketing. Uh, I need you, basically. <laughs> you could be the marketing person. So I'm learning as I go. Um, and it's, a, you know, I'm a real, real amateur in that way. But what I've done is I set up a Facebook page mm -hmm. and I set up an Instagram account. And that's all I have kind of social media wise. Um, and then over time, I've emailed um, shops in the UK. So a few of them have got to know me now, like Aid to the Church in Need have taken oh, okay. a few. Mm -hmm. um, and just uh, our, so the, the National Shrine of England is Walsingham. So the Walsingham Shrine Shop, um, I have a good relationship with them now. So they regularly take um, stock, not loads, but, you know, a good, a good amount each time. Mm -hmm. And then to just varying, various shops around the country. And then this February just gone was quite an exciting time because I was able to go to a a conference for primary religious education leads so that the teachers are like a conference mm -hmm. for primary education teachers for their mm -hmm. re syllabus and i just gave a talk about my books and wow. showed them my books and they i've had a, a repeat customer from that also the head of that for, for, sorry it was for a diocese in wales mm -hmm. i went to and so then the head of that lovely priest he also takes my books regularly for his parish anyway um so slowly, slowly, parishes are taking batches. And now I'm just starting a new campaign with my husband. We're trying this out in that we contact parishes. I've done it once so far, Easter. Contact parishes, We I offer to give a talk after Mass one Sunday. Mm -hmm. And then I set up a stall after the, the two or three Masses on a Sunday. 
and then I sell the books as many as I can after I've given a little talk and then I sell them at the RR like the recommended retail price but um I give a portion of the proceeds to the parish so they get something from it as well so that's sort of getting my name out there even more um and then there's a lovely Radio Maria in England they've asked me to come on so I'll be speaking on there just to get my name out there a bit but it's hard it's a lot of work <laughs> and I have to sort of put a lot I realize you know a lot of it I have to give to God because there are some weeks when life is crazy and busy and I can't do much so I just have to um say god you know if you're meant if i'm meant to get all of these christmas books out you have to sort of uh, you take over this week yeah, I'm tapped it, out. yeah exactly so let me just recap because those are four four ideas that maybe people would not have considered yeah. so one is well it's cold calling but you're outreaching to um mm. uh parishes um priests around yeah. your area uh, or even in the around the country um and just starting conversation with them and then in yeah. your case, they ended up purchasing and then stocking yeah. them, perhaps in the vestibule or the gift shop or something. So that's one. Two, you got in touch with your Catholic radio station, um, yeah. um, either as someone maybe who might run an ad or might uh, give them a piece of content that is valuable to them. Yeah. So you contacted the radio station. Of course, that's valuable for reaching a bunch of people. You uh, like a, you went to a conference or perhaps um, maybe a trade show and connected with people there um, who mm. ended up becoming a retailer or purchasing your books and then i'm drawing a blank on on the last one um but what was the giving you a talk the, after mass was it there and, you go giving the, the yeah. talks after mass i mean that's that's you're yeah. getting right up close and personal with with people and yeah um, so those are those are four things people might not have considered if they're sitting just looking at their facebook page wondering how do i get the numbers up and and yeah these are uh you, you can't call them old school but they're they're more personal real yeah. world uh, offline sorts of things that um are a really good idea to do so and then of course uh, asking uh, god for the insight for the inspiration yeah. give me the next idea give me the next right yeah. thing you know i love i don't know if it's a prayer or not but it's it's the one where it's like if i'm doing the right thing make it feel easy and obvious and if i'm not doing something that you want make it impossible for me to get through oh um, good so i've been trying that one out for a while and <laughs> kind of works and most things are impossible like okay i don't know what you want me to do here to do <laughs> yeah, yeah keep going <laughs> take the next step and that's just yes. all, all you can do he's with you on the ledge remember <laughs> there you go there you go madeline this was wonderful thank you so much for your time where can people find you online if they want to check out what you're doing and order a copy of your books where can they find you yeah. online yeah, so it's um, isaiahbooks.co.uk. We're trying to get the Google thing to work. I like my, I don't even know what it's called, the SEO or something. So sometimes mm -hmm. it's hard to find because obviously uh -huh, there's the book of like Isaiah in the Bible. So when mm -hmm. you sometimes type that in, it doesn't always come up. But sure. I think my husband was like, if you do it all as one word, isaiahbooks.co.uk, mm -hmm. it comes up more. Otherwise, mm -hmm. my Facebook page comes up pretty close and then you can find my website on that. Okay. Now, I'm obviously in the UK, but we do ship worldwide. If And if, if it looks like it's a bit tricky on the website to get the shipping options, you can just, I always just say to people, just email me directly and I can mm -hmm. put it. Because I do, I ship to shops in America as well. So okay. um, I can do deals and things like that. Fantastic. Wonderful. So friends, if you enjoyed this conversation, have a look at the links in the description to visit Isaiah Books and you can support Madeline and the beautiful work that she's doing by purchasing a book and help her break a little more than even maybe save up for something for Christmas. So check out <laughs> isaiahbooks.co.uk in the description um, and then hit the second link, which is to come and join us for the con for Legend Haven, which is October 14th. So uh, again, it is an all free uh, for all day for science fiction and fantasy writers. We do have adult writers in there and we've got, well, we have teens who are writing in there. We have people writing young adult novels and children's novels. And it's, if you enjoy reading or writing fiction, this is a haven that we are putting together for everything that Madeline's been talking about here um, because it's something that is absolutely needed. So uh, please consider joining us and supporting Madeline and her beautiful work. Till next time, everybody, keep writing. God bless you.